science field. What do you think? It's a one-page case report published in 1911 by Alois Alzheimer, first describing this disease. And that's a, a, a paper which has actually now nearly millions of <coughs> Now, uh, but let's start with the inflammatory disease, and this is multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis is, uh, in our Western world, the most common neurological disease of young adults in the Western countries. So it generally starts in, uh, uh, in average in patients in the age between 20 and 30, but there can also be very early onset, is there, there are even children which have multiple sclerosis, and it can also uh, first uh, appear in very late stage, late age, but it is in general it's, it's patients with in the age range between 20 and 30. Now, females are more frequently affected than males, as in many autoimmune diseases, and uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 difference is in the range of about one to one. So what is multiple sclerosis? It's a chronic inflammatory disease of the central nervous system, which leads to focal lesions in the brain, where a particular structure of the brain is destroyed, and these are the myelin sheets. The myelin sheets are more or less the insulation sheets of the opening parts conducting, uh, conducting axon. And then there is, uh, good for research, uh, uh, an animal model, actually, which is called experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, which rep uh, reproduces many, but certainly not all, features of multiple sclerosis. And this model can just be induced if you just take brain tissue, mix it with a strong immune adjuvant and inject it subcutaneously. Then the, uh, the body develops an immune reaction against the brain tissue which protects the brain in the form of a chronic inflammatory disease. Now the pathology of multiple sclerosis has already been defined more than 100, nearly 150 or 130 years ago. And you see some of these re very fine examples here, uh, which are drawn between 1880 and 1915. And what you see here, the macroscopic appearance, is that in the brain white matter, what you have is you have these dark spots, large areas here in the white matter where the myelin sheets are, are gone. And you see here, they are always lined up on these red structures, which are actually small veins and venules. So they develop, these lesions develop around small veins and venules. And the reason for that is that these small veins and venules show signs of inflammation, so the perivascular accumulation of T cells, B cells, and macrophages. Now the specific feature of multiple sclerosis as an inflammatory disease is the type of tissue reaction. What you see here is uh, actually on the surface of the axon, it jumps over the uh, isolated myelin sheets from one or node of RVA to the next. And this is a very quick process of axonal conduction. When you now remove the myelin uh, sheets from the axon, then, uh, so it normally functions that way that the, the impulse comes here to this node of RVA. It interacts with the sodium channels in the, the, in the cell membrane, opens the sodium channels, you get a flux and you get a renewal of an, an amplification of the uh, depolarization of the axons or the impulse, uh, impulse generation. 
Now, when you acutely remove the axon, uh, the myelin sheet from the axon, you have your sodium channels here, just at the node of Rambier, but in the entire uh, part where the myelin sheet has been, there are no sodium channels. Therefore, the induction, the conduction can just go to this uh, the, uh, node of Rambier, and in, uh, make a, an impulse uh, against the axon, an axon potential, but then it has no sodium channels to propagate. So what you get is an acute conduction block. <coughs> However, when that is actually has happened, then uh, the cell, the, the neuron, reacts to that and it redistributes its sodium channels over the entire axon. And then the, the, the impulse uh, jumps just from sodium channel to sodium channel without having these long strips of isolation. So that means the axon conducts again, but it conducts much more slowly. And then you can have the possibility that the uh, myelin sheets are formed again, new, and then you get actually the, again a, 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 a recovery of the, of the conduction, and that is a, called, a process which is called remyelination. So what you have, in, if you destroy the axons acutely, you have a complete loss of axonal function, a, a, a conduction block, and so your neurological function is completely gone. Then you get in the chronic demyelination the slow conduction, so the conduction functions again, but it's relatively uncoordinated and it's very difficult to make them fine movements. And then you have remyelination, it can normalize. Obviously, when in the late stage you get also the distraction of the axon, then the uh, impulse production is completely gone, and there is also no regeneration, so that's permanent clinical deficit in the patient. So, what is the uh, cause of multiple sclerosis? And uh, it's uh, obviously as an inflammatory disease, it was likely to look uh, uh, what, uh, what kind of inflammation is involved. And one has tried that through many studies, uh, but now more recently, these large geno geno uh, ge uh, genetic <coughs> association studies became available, where you can really uh, test for gene polymorphisms uh, in very, very large populations of patients versus controls. And this actually has been done in multiple sclerosis. And the first message which came out was that there is Certainly a genetic trend. If you have an identical twin who has multiple sclerosis, your risk to get the disease is about 300 times higher in comparison to, uh, to the normal population. So there is a clear genetic trend. But if you then try to nail that down to a single gene, things become extremely complicated because there is practically uh, the, the, the only gene which has a bit more <coughs> impact is ac uh, actually the histocompatibility class 2 antigen, uh, HLA-DR15. But that increases the risk only by a factor of about three times instead of the 100 times of the identical twins. And that's the strong, strongest <coughs> genetic association. And so in the early studies, it was just the MHC class 2 was appearing and nothing else, and everybody said, OK, what's going on in that? But then the large GIVA studies came along, where you really can compare now a really very large population. And this is now based on about uh, 20,000 MS patients versus 40,000 controls. And when you do that, what you see is uh, many, many additional genes which have a very minor impact. <coughs> so they increase the risk of getting MS uh, just by a very, very slight, uh, slight uh, factor. Uh, but they all together may end up and accumulate. And when they really come together, then you get uh, the, the increased risk of, the, of, the, of the, uh, what you see in the identical twins. Now, what genes are they which have been identified? We, have now, we are now on the level of 150 MS genes. And these 150 MS genes are, in principle, in the which means this is certainly an immune-mediated disease. And what are these genes doing? Very little. They, the only thing is when they come together, they increase your susceptibility or your aggressiveness of your immune system a little bit more than in the, uh, in the patients or in the population who don't have these genes. 
So it means that the whole genetic just told us it's an inflammatory disease, and the inflammatory disease may be actually enhanced <coughs> or, 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 or maybe made much more easily to occur when your immune system is a little bit more aggressive in comparison uh, to a normal control population. Now, then the question is what uh, kind of inflammation is actually behind it? And, uh, <coughs> Coming from uh, these uh, data from uh, the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, so that you can induce that by direct autoimmunity the disease, which is quite similar. People have actually looked uh, for the mechanisms which are very well, very well known from this model. And when you look in this model, uh, the pathogenesis is relatively clear. You have uh, autoreactive T lymphocytes in the peripheral circulation. And when these autoreactive T cells, for some reason, which we don't really know uh, in humans what the reason could be, get activated, <coughs> they can pass the normal blood-brain barrier, can enter the central nervous system. And when they are then in the central nervous system, they can there find their specific target antigen on antigen-presenting cells like, for instance, perivascular macrophages or microglia cells. And when they do so, they get reactivated and start, in principle, the inflammatory process. And then this inflammatory process activates further macrophages, and these macrophages produce toxins which, in, which uh, destroy the tissue, and here the myelin sheets are more susceptible because they have so complex lipid membranes that if, the, if you disturb from outside, for instance, with oxygen radicals or something, the environment, they are the first to, to actually be destroyed. <coughs> and that can further be enhanced when you have additional autoantibodies which rec recognize specific surface molecules on the myelin sheets. So that's all well known <coughs> and quite nice. And on that basis, actually, all the therapies which we have now <coughs> have been developed. But then it turned out later that uh, although this was very useful and we got a lot of very, very potent and effective therapies, when you then went into more specific therapies which specifically targets this part particular immune response here, yeah, that these therapies become less and less efficient. Suggesting that yes, it's inflammatory, but there is a problem behind it. We are targeting probably the wrong cells. Now, sometimes you can actually learn from individual cases. And I'll show you here two examples of what you can really, you can really learn something. And uh, this all deals with, actually, with true human autoimmunity. So you would actually argue this is just crazy. You would never take a human being and immunize it actively with brain. actually the inactivated rabies vaccine together with the brain tissue where it was grown in. And so that was actually a classical e exposure of, uh, of, of, of this antigen. And there is actually a very nice review again as the year uh, 1928, so sometimes it's useful to look for old literature which actually analyzes all, the, all the, the, the information which was published between 1880 and 19, 1928 on this issue. And what they sh actually showed, that in these rabies vaccination patients, and this is more than 150,000 patients who have been exposed to that, you find in principle in the range of about one out of thousand, you find neurological complications, which are not due to the rabies vaccine, but due to the brain tissue which was injected. And the disease phenotypes were either purely uh, inflammatory in the peripheral nervous system or in the central nervous system, so radical, polyradiculoneuritis or an acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or in a relatively smaller proportion of cases uh, was uh, then uh, a really MS-like disease found. 
Now then, uh, actually such things can even happen nowadays. And that was a, a very interesting story that in Minnesota, uh, about five years ago, there was a disease outbreak of, uh, of these two diseases, uh, polyarticulitis and disseminated leukoencephalitis. And uh, that was actually the Mayo Clinic is in the middle of that, and they, they, they found out these cases. And they realized that the incidence of these diseases was suddenly about 50 times higher than the incidence everywhere during the years before. And then they traced the patients, and they found that all these patients came from the same, same village. Within the village, they all came from the same Now, what was the factory? The factory was a slaughterhouse. And interestingly, at that time, uh, there, there was a big problem with Leon's and, uh, of uh, uh, mad cow's disease. And so uh, it was, there were new regulations that you had to remove uh, the uh, uh, central nervous system tissues of the brain and the spinal cord from the cadavers of the slaughtered animals. And that's a very Bones, you have to take it out, it takes a lot of time. So they got a brilliant idea. They just cut the bones here, they cut the bones here, then they put an air uh, uh, thing into this, uh, into this, uh, 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 this tube, and then blow out the entire spinal cord into the air. And for the brain, they did this also very nicely. They made a hole here, and they had the hole here, put the air part in there, and blew the brain out. So these patients, these people, were actually all exposed for, uh, for, for weeks and months in a continuous working space with an aerosol of brain <laughs> tissue. And they all got autoimmune encephalitis. The outcome you see here in pathology is a massive inflammatory disease of the central nervous system with lots of T-cells and uh, perivascular inflammation. Now there are other possibilities, and that comes that is more historic. There was also in the in the 1950s uh, uh, there was a very good, very big fashion in medicine, and this was called fresh cell therapy. A very nice concept, which is not so so, so far away from mo modern stem cell therapy, which <coughs> means that when you have a problem with your liver, you get a shot of liver cell. Subcutaneously, when you have a problem with your testes, you get a shot of testis cells, and if you have a problem of your brain, you get a shot of brain cells. So that was quite nice, it was a big business, and there were whole, whole clinics in Germany and in Austria and in Switzerland who were living from that. So that, in that case, this is one of those cases. He had, this patient had a mild Hemi Parkinson syndrome. So uh, a neurodegenerative disease, there was no other therapy available, so they made uh, this fresh cell therapy. And he got seven injections over a period of uh, about 17 months. So the first six injections were tolerated very well, and after the seventh injection, actually he started with a progressive paraparesis, paralysis, and neurological disease, and died seven weeks after, after onset. And then when you look at the brain of that, actually this is, we have, uh, we have actually found this case in the cellar of our institute quite recently. What you see is a pathology with all these uh, 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 demyelinating lesions in the brain, which 200% actually reflects what you see in an early stage of multiple sclerosis. So that means, in principle, you can induce the entire disease with uh, just simple brain, uh, brain vaccination. There were, however, uh, two things which were completely new to that. The first thing was the inflammatory infiltrates. The infiltrates in the classical EAE models, autoimmune encephalitis models, are driven by CD4, MHC class 2 restricted CD4 positive T cells. Now, here in this case, <coughs> there were numerous B cells numerous CD8 cells, T cells, but practically no, B, no CD4 positive T cells present. So that means in principle that to get the MS-like pathology, 
it's probably not the CD4 T cells which are really those which drive the disease. And that may explain why these therapies which are selectively targeted in MS patients, the CD4 cells, were ineffective. Now, the second uh, uh, important uh, lesson from, uh, from this uh, uh, case is, and from all these autoimmune cases, is in principle uh, the disease, the MS-like disease, in these cases is active as when you stop the active immunization, then the That means the disease itself dies out, the pe people recover, and they have never really MS. So they have the acute episode as long as they are peripherally sensitized, but they, are, they, they don't keep up with the disease. So there is the, the big question, what is actually driving uh, the chronic uh, active inflammatory disease in MS, which is more or less completely unresolved. And that's still the case now. Now, having said that, uh, there are now a lot of different models of autoimmune encephalomyelitis available. You can use the disease in mice, in rats, in guinea pigs, in hamsters, in rabbits, in, in monkeys, uh, even in humans. And so there are numerous models available. And the models which are most frequently used, obviously, are the mice, mouse models, because they are the marvelous tools for molecular biologists and immunologists to play around with. But the problem with that is if you then compare these models uh, as how, how much they reflect multiple sclerosis, then what you see is that the best reflection you get in the human autoimmune encephalitis, you get it quite nicely in other primates. But the more you go back here, you come actually to diseases which are predominantly inflammatory with a bit neurodegeneration, which are quite far away from what you see in multiple sclerosis. So these models, which are used by, in principle by 80-90% of the researchers in the field, are actually those which are the most farthest away from the human disease. So that means, again, when you are working in this field, you have to really think about what question of MS you want to, to solve with your model, and whether your, your model actually can, can mimic or can reflect this at all. That's a very critical issue. Sorry? Yeah? Um, do researchers know anything about encasements in these inflammatory uh, the in cases are certainly uh, not very well studied. There is a subpopulation of NK cells, which are actually regulatory NK cells, and they appar apparently play a major role in MS because when you stimulate them, for instance, with an anti, uh, anti CD25 antibody, uh, then uh, you can actually uh, you get a quite a nice uh, uh, therapeutic effect in the patient. Uh, whether other NK cells, which are more or less AD, have ADCC function <coughs> or others, whether they play a role is relatively unknown. And the problem there is it's very difficult to dissect in the brain because many of the, of the NK cell markers, which you can use, if you go into the brain, they are actually expressed on brain cells also. And so you get, you get in, a, in a terrible mess. And therefore, uh, the, 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 the information is relatively sparse. So then the question is, what do we ha have now for therapies in multiple sclerosis? And that's uh, just a graph which shows you uh, the development in the therapy. So we started uh, early with uh, two therapies, which is pizza interferon and glatiromere acetate, uh, which actually uh, work quite well. They, you, you get about 30% reduction of, of, of clinical activity, disease activity, and they have practically no side effects. But the problem is that the efficacy of these therapies is relatively poor. And then uh, we have a dramatic now increase of uh, additional therapeutic potentials. So for instance, some like, for instance, fingolimod or natalizumab uh, um, are molecules which actually block the entry of, uh, of uh, leukocytes, of T cells, B cells, and macrophages 
from the center periphery into the central nervous system. And the natalizumab is uh, an antibody against an alpha-4 integrin, which is important for the interaction with the blood-brain barrier. The fingolimod is actually a, a, a molecule which uh, is important for the migration of CCR7 positive cells from the lymph nodes into the, into the, the circulation. And when you block these, these pathways, you have less cells which can go into the central nervous system. They have nice effects. Then you have actually the alentusumab here, which is quite nice. It is it's a, a very effective antibody which depletes T cells and T cells. But you get it nowadays even also a very nice and uh, therapeutic effect also by blocking B cells alone. And so we have now a, a relatively They are working sufficiently that you have actually a very stable situation with no relapses, and this is very fine. But when uh, that actually the disease breaks through, aggressive immunotherapies where you can really hold the disease very nicely, but under under uh, the, the the problem of risks uh, of potential risks of the drugs, for instance, the natalizumab is a uh, these blocking antibody or blocking cells in going into, into the central nervous system are really a problem because in a small percentage they actually uh, allow the appearance of a virus-induced uh, central nervous system disease, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And when you get that, actually you are in a big problem because there is practically no, no uh, no uh, uh, real uh, therapy available, and that is in a, a very high percentage uh, fatal, so, so you can die on that. And then you have also, uh, with those which are more, more severely interfering with the immune system, they can uh, induce actually other autoimmune diseases in the patients, or they may also, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the small, small molecule drugs, are, are many of them are associated with onco uh, oncogenic potential. So that's uh, a problem we get, we get more. We have now here the aventusumab blocking T and B cells. We have the uh, tatlizumab, which is actually stimulating the uh, suppressor cells. We have anti B cell therapies. And it's quite interesting that it now turns out that the uh, elimination of the T lymphocytes actually is as effective as any of the other therapies, which suggests that it is not like we have thought for 30 or 40 years that it's the CD4 T cells which drive the disease, but that it's rather than the B cells which drive the disease. So, this is the early stage of multiple sclerosis, uh, but the problem is that when these patients uh, 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 are not sufficiently treated in these early stages, that sooner or later they actually de uh, develop a background of severe neurological uh, deficit. And when they reach this background, then the disease switches from a relapsing, remitting disease with uh, bouts of the disease and remissions where the patient patients recover very well into a steadily progressive disease. And this is actually something which is very bad for the patients because that ultimately in the patients results in uh, very severe neurological deficits where they then actually have to end up in a wheelchair or even in a bedroom state. And so in, prin in principle, in the early stages, uh, the uh, disease uh, severity and uh, the rapid rapidity of the disease course very much is very variable and depends on the, on the intensity of these in new inflammatory <coughs> parts that the patients have. But when they reach this critical threshold, then the disease uh, takes its own course and, and goes relatively steadily. So what is happening there? Now, uh, the first thing what is really happening is, is that the pathology changes. What you see in the early stages here with this blue and the, the green lesions is that there are mainly lesions in the white, in the white matter, so in the areas where the axons and the massive uh, uh, accumulation of the myelin sheets are there. But then when they come into the progressive stage, you see actually then a massive increase in these red lesions and even also in these uh, pink lesions, these are lesions in the gray matter. 
Now you would think the lesions in the gray matter now mean neurodegeneration and no longer demyelination. This is not true. There is also myelin in the gray matter. And the lesions are actually demyelinating lesions in the gray matter. Whereas the neurons are relatively well preserved. What is the difference is that the lesions in the gray matter are associated with an inflammatory process which is mainly present in the meninges, so are these connective tissue things which cover the brain from the outside. There is another difference what's happening is that in the early stages what you see is that the inflammation which you see in the blue cells is always associated with blood-brain barrier damage. So that means here new waves of inflammatory cells come from the peripheral immune system past the blood-brain barrier, induce a dysfunction of the blood-brain barrier and enter the, 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 the central nervous system and give rise to new lesions. Now, if you look at the progressive stage, you see also very nicely these inflammatory cells, but there is no serum leakage. And the reason for that is that in this case, the inflammatory cells are already within the brain. They are sitting there, and they are more or less trapped within the brain behind a closed or repaired blood-brain barrier. And that has, a major, has major consequences, because if that's really the case, then uh, if you have now anti-inflammatory drugs, which are peptides or, or small proteins, like most of the most effective drugs which we have, so you need in principle about 500 times higher concentrations in the peripheral circulation to reach a pharmacologically active concentration in the brain. So that means in principle that these drugs against the inflammatory reaction here within the brain. So to do that, you have actually either to develop completely new drugs which go through the blood brain barrier, or you have to try to apply the drugs left, uh, within the central nervous system directly, so into the cerebrospinal fluid. So the second point is, in the progressive stage, there is this also this change in the, in the pathology that means that you get uh, these particular, these cortical lesions. And these cortical lesions are demyelinating. You see that here, this is a myelin stain. Here's still myelin. You have the higher cortex here, the meninges on top. And this is completely white, so the whole, whole myelin is, is wiped out. So generally, many people in the immunology field in general think this demyelination is just a simple consequence of the inflammatory and the chronic inflammatory reaction. But this is fundamentally wrong. Because if you compare this disease now with other diseases, like for instance the second one, which is tuberculous meningitis. Tuberculous meningitis is very interesting for comparison because it has a composition of inflammatory infiltrates which is nearly identical to that one you see in multiple scales. You see the same numbers, percentages of T cells, B cells, activated macrophages, plasma cells, the uh, only difference is that the inflammatory reaction in the tuberculous meningitis is even uh, a factor of five to six times higher than in MS. Now, despite having that in multiple sclerosis, you see, if you look at the brown staining in this thing, the myelin sheets of the cerebral cortex are totally intact. So that means this inflammatory reaction must induce something which is extremely specific for MS. You can also look at other things like here, Rasmussen encephalitis, a disease which is main, main mediated by CD8 T cells, or a B like cell lymphoma, which is uh, where the whole brain is over flooded with activated and highly activated malignant B cells. Again, the myelin sheet is completely normal. Now that's a very nice situation because you can now actually take that and make a comparative study of, of human expression, what is actually happening when you take, in principle, the, the active MS lesions and compare that with the tuberculosis lesions, with Alzheimer's disease as a neurodegenerative control, and with uh, normal controls. And interestingly, what uh, we have done then and what came out was that there is a an extremely massive oxidative injury in the MS brains, which is much, much more what, uh, as what you see in any other inflammatory disease or in any other neurodegenerative disease. 
And then when you look at the, uh, at the uh, neurons of the brain tissue, uh, for instance, by using a marker for oxidized phospholipids, more or less as a marker for dying cells or so, uh, for, for massive, uh, cells with massive oxidative injury, you can actually watch the cells as, uh, while they are dying. So this is an apoptotic cell. This is a cell, a neuron with process fragmentation. And this is a cell, a neuron reactive to the uh, proximal destruction of the axon. So that is actually something that you can follow. Uh, I'll skip that. Uh, yes, the question is then, why, why do we have this profound oxidative injury? And uh, the, there are certainly three possibilities why that can happen. And the first is that it may be driven directly by the inflammatory process. So in that case, the inflammation actually activates <coughs> macrophages and microglia. They produce, uh, in, uh, they, they come into the oxidative burst, they produce enzymes which actually uh, produce radicals, and, uh, nitric oxide and uh, uh, oxygen radicals. This is one possibility. Now the second possibility is that uh, you damage the mitochondria because damaged mitochondria are also a very, very potent source for radical production. And the third thing is that you have actually a liberation of divalent uh, cations, like for instance iron, zinc, and others, in the tissue, which then can further amplify oxidative damage. Now, all three, have, all three mechanisms happen in principle in parallel in the MS brain. So what you see first of all here is the massive upregulation of NADPH oxidase in, uh, the, uh, in the microglia macrophage population in the brain. And you see that actually in immunocytochemistry also very well. The blue reaction is the NADPH oxidase being expressed exclusively in the microglia. <laughs> the brown is the, oxidative, uh, the oxidized phospholipids as a marker for oxidized damage, for instance here in neurons. And you can see how these activated microglia even embrace these neurons with their processes and then the neurons have <coughs> very massive oxidative injury. So this is certainly one mechanism. Now the second is uh, that what, you, what one sees in these, uh, in these particular lesions that the mitochondria are damaged. And you see a profound damage in the respiratory chain, the complex uh, four, but also in part in the complex two. So this is about 70% uh, reduction, and this is about 30% reduction. And that's uh, uh, exclusively in the active uh, in the lesions in the active stage of tissue destruction. Not only that, if the process goes longer and further, you get in addition then mitochondrial DNA damage. The mitochondria have their own DNA, and so when uh, the uh, when you have massive oxidative injury, chronic oxidative injury, <coughs> also the mitochondrial DNA can be damaged. And you can see that here. This was a rather elegant study here uh, performed by a colleague, colleague of mine from Edinburgh, together with us. Uh, where he actually looked first on uh, cells using markers for the respiratory chain. And then if you use the marker for complex two and complex four and double stain them, then you can see that those cells which only express the complex two but not the complex four have actually respiratory deficient mitochondria. So they are in a problem. And these are the blue cells here. And you can, you can identify them. And then you can actually take them out, cut them out single by laser uh, microdissection, and then uh, take these cells and sequence the mitochondrial DNA in these cells, single cells. And what you then see is in these particular cells with the uh, with these uh, uh, respiratory deficiency, you see widespread and massive uh, 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 clonal deletions of the. Uh, of the mitochondrial DNA. And that is particularly the case in multiple sclerosis. And then you see, for instance, in Alzheimer's controls, this is very little. So there is also oxidative damage in Alzheimer's disease, but it's apparently much, much less pronounced than in MS. And then the, this, this is a, an important story because uh, the mitochondrial damage actually happens both not only directly in the cortex, but also in the white matter in the lesions. When you have this inflammatory lesion with oxidative injury in the white matter, you focally damage the mitochondria, which are the red ones here. 
And what then happens is that the neuron has a retrograde transport of mitochondria, an uh, anterograde and retrograde transport of mitochondria. So they shuffle from the processes into the cell body and again back into the processes. And when you have defective mitochondria here, after some time they actually end up in the cytoplasm. And then they expand there and then are again transported back into the, into the axon. And that actually further damages uh, or amplifies uh, the, the, the mitochondrial damage of the entire neuron. <laughs> so that means in the early stages you have an acute mitochondrial injury, mainly blockade of complex 4 of the respiratory chain. And then you get your uh, consequence. stage you will get the accumulation of mitochondrial DNA deletions. This uh, is a relatively slow process but it then increases slowly and gradually the uh, neuronal dysfunction and leading then to the more or less slow and chronic uh, of the disease. Now why is that important for the function of axons? Because you need the mitochondria uh, particularly for the repolarization of the axon. When you have an axon potential uh, and uh, a depolarization of the axon, you get an influx, massive influx of sodium in the axon from the extracellular space. And to get rid of the sodium in the axon, you have the, uh, the active sodium pump here. And the sodium pump is uh, energy dependent. That is very important energy dependent. So when you have actually uh, dysfunctional mitochondria, you cannot get rid of the axon uh, of the sodium within the axon. And that has a problem because then we have a second molecule, which is the sodium calcium exchanger. And this is normally has the function to pump calcium out of the axon. Uh, because uh, you have in the axon very little sodium, you can pump the calcium in the, from the axon out and the sodium, uh, instead of the sodium, comes in. But when you increase the sodium, it comes in the opposite direction. So it, pump, it pumps sodium out and calcium into the axon. And that is a major problem because the calcium is then activating all the downstream enzyme systems leading to dissolution of the cytoskeleton, uh, disturbance of axonal transport and axonal demise. So that's why I go into that. This is important because for the neuroprotective therapies in multiple sclerosis, these are exactly the targets. So the microglia, then the, uh, the uh, mitochondrial injury, and also the blockade of certain axonal channels where you can then actually slow down or, or reduce uh, the, 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 the damage by, by this type of therapy. Okay, so the last point where uh, you, we have uh, oxidative injury further potentiated is actually <coughs> iron. And iron is an important molecule. Uh, it is um, needed in particular in the brain for brain function, for all sorts of synaptic function, for myelination, for many, many different reasons, because many of the, <coughs> of the important and essential enzymes work uh, uh, in iron control factor, and that's what particularly also the case. Now we have in principle, the iron can, uh, can be present in two stages, in the uh, trivalent iron, uh, that's bound to ferritin and completely non-toxic. And then the divalent iron, which actually can so the iron 2, which uh, can actually lead to oxidative injury. However, the iron itself has a relatively low toxic component, so it's not very aggressive. But when you have that in together with the, uh, with the hydrogen peroxide, so with a, with a classical oxidative injury, you get the so-called Fenton reaction and you produce the hydroxy radicals. And the hydroxy radicals are more or less the most aggressive oxidative uh, molecules, which you can, can build in the, in the body. So how is that with the iron? And I'll just concentrate on this blue line. That is actually the iron concentration in the human brain in uh, relation to aging. 
So that means everybody of us is slowly and steadily accumulating iron in the brain. And when you reach my age, you have really a rusty brain. <laughs> so that you can see here, this is in principle the case. Now, that is not the major problem. This iron is actually taken up by oligodendrocytes and myelin sheets, and it is stored in oligodendrocytes coupled to ferritin. And that has no major consequences. It can be liberated in part when it's necessary, but otherwise it's non-toxic. But when you then destroy the oligodendrocytes, in principle, then you liberate the iron <coughs> relatively explosively in the tissue. And that's nicely shown here. You have, uh, for instance, again in a lesion of multiple sclerosis, you see on top of it the uh, normal white matter where you see all the oligodendrocytes brown with iron and ferritin. Then you come to the active lesion where the oligodendrocytes are destroyed. You see a lot of iron here and it's taken up into microglia. And then in the center, the, iron, uh, the microglia with the iron is getting it lost because the microglia also gradually dies when it takes up too much iron. And you see even then in a the high magnification that the iron is not only in the microglia, but this, you see all these granules in between that is just diffuse iron 2 and iron 3 in the extracellular space. <coughs> so that obviously is a further amplification then. So what that means in principle, that in multiple sclerosis we start in principle first with an inflammatory brain disease mediated by T cells and B cells, probably the B cells being more important than T cells. And that leads then to the to their cytokine production, to the activation of macrophage in microglia, and to nothing on the dispersion. And you get the first more important which then actually damages mitochondria. And uh, mitochondria are probably in the cell the most susceptible uh, 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 components are uh, again uh, uh, or most susceptible uh, uh, the organelles cause this injury. Now, when you damage the mitochondria and you damage, in principle, the complex tools together with the complex four, what you get is additional radical production, not only energy deficiency but also radical production. That I, that means you further increase the oxygen damage. On the other hand. You have the mitochondrial injury and you get energy deficiency, that actually has consequences. Actual consequences, so your brain cells, they're still alive, but they cannot work properly because they have oxygen and, uh, uh, and uh, as of, oxy of their oxygen they need actually for function. And so when you reduce oxygen first, they, they just sh stop their function, but they still are still alive only when you go down in a very low level that they also die. So you get already in an early stage massive functional consequences with, in principle, neurological deficits. And that explains why in MS patients, uh, in particular in the early stages, when you treat them quickly and deactivate the macrophages, they can actually recover within hours or days from their, from their disease, from their disease part. And this is not because the tissue recovers are okay. This is just because the functional deficit goes away and the mitochondrial function is cleared again. But when this goes over that, then you get to the radicals also DNA damage into energy deficiency and then cell death. And there are now in the pharmaceutical industry a lot of different uh, approaches which are currently tested. And this is uh, substances which block uh, the microglia activation, which may uh, be used as radical scavengers, as mitochondrial protection, and also downstream the channel blockers, which are, are, are used are now developed as, as new therapies for a neuroprotective therapy in multiple sclerosis. And it is very hopeful because if they really work in MS in the late stage of MS. It is pretty likely that they also work in diseases like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Because mechanis mechanisms are quite similar. Now, so far we are far away from that. We have beautiful anti-inflammatory drugs and multiple sclerosis is now the best treatable disease in neurology which is available. So it's really a major, uh, major uh, advance which happened during the last about 15 years. Uh, 
when the patients have reached the progressive stage, we are still not far away from that. So these neuroprotective uh, therapies don't really work very well, with only one exception here. And this is actually a, a high dose biotin, which increases in principle the oxygen, or uh, the, 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 the ATP production uh, in, uh, through, through massively feeding into the Krebs cycle and uh, raising the energy level, correcting the mitochondrial dysfunction and the, uh, this, the, 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 the mitochondrial dysfunction and energy deficiency. And that has certainly a lot of uh, a massive functional effect because sometimes patients treated with that immediately when they are lying more or less in bed, get out of the bed and can walk again. So that is, this is in part dramatic. Whether it really has a long-term effect as a neuroprotective tract has not as to be determined. So that was in principle multiple sclerosis and we have now the option either we can make a short break if you want or we can directly go for the second half and then uh, finish a bit earlier. But we can also take questions of it. I would have a short question. <coughs> so what about stem cell therapy? Because I stumbled across a study in two thousand. Yeah, like, I know. Summer, basically, where they followed up uh, for three years, and it seemed to work in some patients. So this is in uh, the stem cell therapies currently are in the stage of hopeful thinking. Uh, what is clear is that uh, stem cells have various different uh, uh, potential functions. So on the one hand, they can, uh, in principle, replace uh, 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 damaged uh, cells or structures, so they can actually uh, be involved in remyelination. They can even, it's discussed, although this is very, very uh, controversial, uh, replace neurons functionally. Uh, that is not very well shown. Uh, but uh, the problem with that function of stem cells is it was the first papers published in major journals were actually sensational. And then in the repeat, it turned out that uh, in principle, it's, it's possibly only 1% or 2% of the remyelinated uh, areas uh, in a, in a, even in the animal brain really comes from the stem cells. So this is probably not very effective. The second thing is that the stem cells can actually provide trophic factors, cytokines, uh, which stimulate endo endogenous regeneration. And that has actually been shown in several uh, experimental studies. Although also here uh, the data are in part uh, uh, very but in part very, very lousy, I have to say. And I'll, I'll give you an explanation why, why, why well, uh, one of the major problems is. Now, the third thing is that the stem cells can actually be immunosuppressive. And they can do that in the central nervous system, but also in the peripheral lymph node. Uh, there, this, is, this is well shown. So you, can, you can even uh, characterize this on a neurological basis. Apparently, this is not very effective and not long-lasting. Because there we come to the first problem of stem cells. There is currently no how you actually can shut off stem cells when they do wrong. And sometimes they do wrong. There is, for instance, the problem of so-called glyomatosis cerebri, which comes from undifferentiated stem cells with a very, very low proliferation rate. This incubation time for the glyomatosis cerebri is about 10 to 15 years in, in humans. You have no chance to, uh, to detect this risk in any of the experimental studies. And then there are now uh, first papers coming out of brain tumors, actually real brain tumors, uh, in the stem cell transplants. Mm -hmm. Several case reports, uh, it, it's clear that this problem is there. Now, with respect to the therapeutic effects, uh, there is a very, uh, if you go into even of many, many of the nature papers, for instance, with the local intracerebral injection, so what they do, they induce EAE, they get a spinal cord disease, they inject the stem cells into the brain, and then they get less, less EAE disease. Now, the brain does not cause any neurological problems in the mouse or a rat. It's a clinically silent region. 
when you uh, and when you inject something foreign and that can be not stem cells, can be anything else, into the brain in an EAE model, you actually attract the inflammatory cells into the brain. And with that, you have less inflammatory cells in, in the spinal cord, and you have a therapeutic effect, which is complete artifact and rubbish. Mm -hmm. But this is, if you look at the papers uh, um, here, this is practically never really controlled well. So altogether, yes, stem cells can do some things. Yes, they are <coughs> potentially scientifically extremely interesting. Uh, many of the papers are unfortunately very bad, even when published in the most, most prestigious journals. And from a clinical point of view, in particular for safety reasons, they are far away from clinical application. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking because this is apparently the Lancet study this summer that came out, mm -hmm. and there they just um, kind of did this, uh, what's it called? Um, autologous hematopathic stem cell transplantation. Yeah. yeah. So basically, as far as I understand, they eradicate the whole immune ah, so system. So this basically. is this is a this is a difference. So, so this is not repair of the brain. This is un this mm -hmm. is uh, an immune therapy. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is true, you can do a more or less complete immune ablation and then uh, do an, auto, uh, uh, an autologous or an even also a heterologous uh, stem cell transplantation by building up more or less a new immune system. Uh, that works in some cases quite well. Uh, uh, it works in principle as good as, for instance, the, the alemtuzumab treatment, but certainly not better. And uh, it has uh, certainly much higher risks. Because the procedure is much, much more risky. And the problem with the uh, building of a new immune system is if MS is driven by an exogenous agent, like, for instance, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, then when you actually build up a new immune system, uh, you will, this will also get exposed to this exogenous trigger, and you will sooner or later end up with a <coughs> So yes, we know from, from, from that that there are few patients actually uh, which, which were treated which had really a very nice therapeutic effect. Uh, there were others which were, they were, the effect was, was very poor. And uh, then the question then for application is, is it superior to uh, drug treatment? And in principle, at the present moment, it doesn't look like that. Okay. Yeah? Okay, so you want to continue with Alzheimer's disease while you are exhausted. Okay, then let's go further because then we can finish it. So this is actually the guy who is very famous. You see him here, Alois Alzheimer. He was a neuropathologist working in Munich. And it's quite interesting. This whole thing is a single case report and interestingly Alzheimer was not very interested in this particular case. He was actually much more interested in social psychiatry than in, in neuroscience or in, in neurodegeneration but he stumbled across this case and he has new technologies of silver impregnation and he found it and just wrote a very nice paper, very, very clearly well written, well described paper on what's going on in this particular single patient. So what's going on in Alzheimer? You see here very nicely the uh, comparison between a normal human aging brain and an Alzheimer brain. And what is very clear is that the salt side between the, the, the gyri of the cortex, so the, between the, the, these, they are much wider, so there's profound loss of tissue within the cerebral <coughs> cortex here uh, of these Alzheimer patients in comparison to what you see in a control case. So the brain is smaller and, the, uh, and, and also the whole brain tissue has shrunk quite a lot. And this is particularly the case in the cortex, whereas other structures like for instance <coughs> the bellomere are fairly more towards the spinal cord of the brain cell. So what happens uh, in principle, what uh, regions are affected? 
So in principle, in the late stage of Alzheimer's disease, nearly all brain cortex lesions are, regions are somehow affected. But in the early stages of the disease, the disease, uh, the, the process starts in a specific region. And this is particularly here in the temporal lobe, in particular here in the hippocampus and in the, in the uh, uh, entorhinal cortex. Uh, that's uh, much earlier affected than any other regions. There is also an interesting thing which is completely ununderstood that the classical motor and sensory <coughs> cortex, so the precentral gyros, the postcentral gyros, the optic cortex, etc., etc., are practically not involved in Alzheimer's disease. It is completely unclear why this is why, why these, these cortical regions are completely spared. But you know, these regions which are affected, they, they are certainly a problem because you have in principle here uh, the situation of the reduction here. studies in Alzheimer's disease made with uh, positron em emission tomography. So what you can in that, uh, in principle, uh, measure is how much glucose is used in, in, in particular brain regions. And what you can see in the control here is that in particular the gray matter is red. That means it, it, it uses a lot of glucose, uh, a lot, lot, lot of glucose uh, metabolism. And that's actually Alzheimer's disease. And what you can see is that in the depth of the, uh, of the, the deep gray matter nuclei, they are fairly normal, like here, the thalamus or the, uh, the corpus triatum. <laughs> but there is a massive loss of glucose utilization in the entire cortex. Obviously, this is a patient in a relatively late stage of Alzheimer's disease. So what has been described by Iris Alzheimer at this uh, original uh, uh, in this original paper, he showed in principle two different types of brain changes in the cortex. The one are these brown spots here, and you would have to think about that if you just take a normal cortex of a normal young or even a normal age patient, uh, this would be completely white. So what you see here in the AD patients, there are the, all these brown spots, and these are extracellular uh, deposits of a misfolded protein, and in that case, for the extracellular uh, 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 portion, this misfolded protein is the so-called beta peptide uh, derived from the amyloid precursor protein. I will come to that point much more in detail. And then the second uh, uh, change, what he described, is the intracellular uh, changes in neurons. And you see that here, you see a pyramidal neuron here, and that should be actually again complete white, but what you see here is this uh, very dark brown area, and this is actually again the insoluble, uh, uh, a misfolded protein, but in, the, in this case, in the intercellular uh, changes here, in the intercellular tangles, it is not uh, the ATP or epita protein, but it's a uh, misfolded hyperphosphorus. Two major uh, changes. Now, where do they come from? Now, the A beta deposits come from a molecule which is the, called the amyloid precursor protein, or ATP. And this amyloid precursor protein is a protein which has several functions. It's part adhesion molecules, in part uh, uh, also signaling functions. 
uh, in part also a protease inhibitor domain in the extracellular cells. <coughs> but what amyloid precursor protein really does is, is still not really well known because you can knock out the APP without any problems in mice and they have no problem with that. The only thing is they don't, take off, don't get amyloid deposits. Um, it's it's a, in, 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 in old age or so. So it's, it's not completely clear. The only thing that has been shown in these amyloid APP knockout mice is that their performance in cognitive tests is a little bit inferior compared to normal mice. But this is rather subtle. Now, this amyloid precursor protein is normally cut by a protease, and this is the so-called alpha secretase. And the alpha secretase cuts uh, the amyloid precursor uh, protein just here in the middle of this road, the red domain. On the middle of this red, red domain is the middle of the a, uh, uh, a beta molecule, which is actually deposited in our cells. So if you have a normal alpha secretase cutting, no deposition occurs and everything is fine. But you can have the problem that you get another enzyme here which cuts uh, the molecule at the wrong position. And this is the so-called beta secretase, which cuts it just on this place here. And if that's happening, then the alpha secretase <coughs> can no longer bind to this particular beta segment and cannot cut it here in the middle again because it, has not, it doesn't have the binding domains. So it remains intact. And then you have a third protease, the so-called gamma secretase, which cuts it out from here. Now, these blue areas, the intracellular and the extracellular portion of this APP molecule will then be further degraded. But what is left over is this a beta peptide, which has now two major problems. The first, its conformation is unstable, and it shifts from an alpha helical into a beta pleated sheet structure. And the second problem which it has is that uh, the normal uh, brain proteases are no longer able actually to cleave this, this, this peptide. And so it just stays there where it's built and, and there's, you know, there's no removal. Now, when you can you see here the cutting sites of these uh, the, the, the gamma secretase in, uh, uh, here in the middle in the uh, transmembrane region, and the alpha and the beta secretase on, the, uh, on these uh, on these uh, bit out, outside. And you can if you can imagine that uh, this cutting very much depends on the structure of the APP molecule. So when you actually change the amino acid sequence of the APP molecule by mutations, uh, then you can actually influence the, uh, the, the speed and effectiveness of how this is cut through the alpha, beta, or gamma secretase. And there are now, in Alzheimer's disease, you see all these red, uh, uh, red things, are mutations which have been found in different patients with familial forms of Alzheimer's disease. And these mutations can be either directly in the cutting domain, or they can be even quite far distance away. But whenever these mutations are there, the molecule is changed in a way that it shifts the balance between alpha secretase cleavage versus beta plus gamma secretase cheer cleavage. <coughs> that were the first uh, uh, cleavage sites which have been described. So in principle, when we now look at the uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease in general, we have uh, two types of Alzheimer's disease. The one is the so-called familial Alzheimer's disease, and the other is the sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And in the familial Alzheimer's disease, uh, they are a bit different because they develop the disease earlier. So in that case, they can even develop Alzheimer's disease at an age of 30 or, or something, some 50 or so, whereas in the spontaneous Alzheimer's disease, they generally, they, they do find no case uh, younger than 65. So that is one of the differences. And then you see clearly a familial aggregation of these cases uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in these particular cases. And if you then do genetic analysis, you find mutations in three different proteins. And Uh, but uh, the vast 
majority of uh, mutations you see actually in a gene which is uh, here called PS1 or pre senilin one And then there are, uh, another gene which is pre senilin 2 which has <coughs> also mutations. Now what are the pre -senilins? The pre are actually components of the gamma secretase. So that means you can you have your mutations either in the in the target gene which has to be cut in the target protein, or you can also have the mutations in one of the key enzymes which are is important for the cut. So these are the familial forms, but in that case, only about five percent of the Alzheimer maybe with more detailed genetic analysis, up to 10% of the Alzheimer patients fall into this category of familial Alzheimer's disease. All the others are sporadic. And then you have, in principle, another genetic factor which plays a role. And this is in the sporadic cases. Uh, uh, that is a, a gene which is uh, uh, mutations or polymorphisms in the APOE4 gene. And in that case, when you have actually the APOE4 uh, uh, genotype, then uh, you have an increased susceptibility of, uh, of sporadic Alzheimer's disease, which means in principle not the that really the susceptibility is changed, but that you get the disease a bit earlier with a bit more rapid uh, evolvement. Uh, because otherwise, uh, if you if it's going if it comes later and it, it's going very slow, then you die before on other reasons. But this is if you would live longer, you would also. <laughs> so, what are these molecules? You see here uh, the molecule of the uh, gamma secretase. It's a, a transmembrane molecule uh, which contains actually of uh, at least uh, five to six. It's it's, it's uh, seven different sub sub uh, sub proteins. In principle, it's a large complex. And two of these proteins, actually, which you have in here, are on the one hand the pre one and the pre <coughs> that can have the mutations which are associated with the disease. And then you have the other, which is the beta secretase, or also called base, beta side ATP deleting enzyme. And uh, again, uh, this uh, has, uh, has uh, a, a, a uh, one of the substrates of these enzymes is the ATP. Now, pharma industry has actually really spent a tremendous lot of efforts to develop blockers of these beta and gamma secretase molecules. And because as a therapy for, uh, for Alzheimer's disease patients or even as a tool to prevent the disease. However, they, they found beautiful blockers which actually could inhibit or completely block the formation of uh, bitter deposits in vitro and in, in, in culture and in, 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 in part even in mouse models. None of them actually made it into the clinic. And the reason for that is that these gamma and bitter secretases have so many other molecules which they can and have to be that when you block them, you come into really major problems with side effects. So the, for instance, many of the notch proteins, etc., are also cleaned by these, by these enzymes. So that means that this part of, our, of inhibition strategy is actually more or less out of our business. So what happens now in the Alzheimer's <coughs> disease? When you get uh, the formation of these a, a beta uh, molecules is predominantly in the region of the synapses. And the reason for that is that ATP is a molecule which is produced in the cell body. It's then transported down the axon by uh, fast axonal transport and accumulates in the synaptic region, regions where it has at least one of the functions is also to help to make the connectivity between the uh, synaptic terminal and the postsynaptic membrane. And then you have out there, when you get this wrong cleavage, you get the deposition of the A-bitter 
first monomers, then dimers, and then multimers, and then uh, actually more and more uh, bitter bleated fibrils, uh, which are then deposited at this site. And that has uh, consequences. First of all, it detaches the synapses from uh, the neurons, and it leads to synaptic degeneration. And so therefore, uh, the synaptic loss and synaptic <coughs> degeneration is a much, much better correlate for the dysfunct brain dysfunction and the cognitive state of the Alzheimer patients than it <coughs> is, from a clinical point of view, is the uh, synaptic dysfunction. Now, it has, however, also additional problems because it induces changes in the cytoskeletal proteins here in these uh, axons, in particular in the tau proteins, and that uh, actually accumulates, and that they can also then are transported through retrograde axonal transport into the, center, into the cell body, and then you get the uh, accumulation of these intracellular uh, phosphorylated tau undigestible phosphorylated tau. <coughs> so why is that the case? Uh, this is, there are several possibilities. Uh, one which is relatively attractive is uh, that uh, the tau accumulation of phosphorylation, what you see, is actually in part a reaction to synaptic denervation. Why is that the case? Because in a normal situation, in a, uh, a normal developing neuron, you have in principle uh, a, a phosphorylated tau because it destabilizes the, the cytoskeleton and the microtubules. So the dendrites uh, and axons are right quite flexible to, to grow in all directions. When you then get synaptic input, you get a dephosphorylation of the tau, it stabilizes the microglia, the, micro, the, 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 the microtubules, and you get your fixed position of the synapses because it's, uh, it's more or less fixed on the particular, particular place of the neurons by the stabilized microtubules. Now, when you then again remove the synapses from the, from, from, from the postsynaptic membrane, the, start, the whole process starts again and the tau gets phosphorylated and the, the processes can again look for other connections and, 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 um, <coughs> and findings. Well, now, in, if that actually then lasts for quite a while and more and more, and more time, then you get more and more over-phosphorylation of tau which then ends up in a situation where the proteolytic enzymes can no longer cleave it. And then you get uh, the, 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 the proteins which then also fall into beta for the gene structures and then aggregate. Good. So, uh, obviously, again, this uh, part of the story can be amplified by genetic mutations. And uh, what you can actually see is you have different splice variants of the tau molecule, and uh, you can have mutations in the tau molecule which actually propagate uh, the deposition of certain tau subforms in the tissue. And that is then associated with different diseases, so called tauopathies, which are not only Alzheimer like, but they can then be purely neurodegenerative without any. Uh, any so to show in principle that these two things are interconnected is very well shown in a transgenic uh, system because if you make now a transgenic mouse model where you overexpress either normal or, or, or mutated uh, apita protein you get, in principle, uh, a situation where you get just a deposition of, uh, of plaques, that means of a beta uh, uh, deposits in an extracellular space, but you don't get the neuritic and, uh, uh, and tau pathology in these particular mice. And this is a major shortcoming of an Alzheimer mice, the conventional Alzheimer mice. They have a brain amyloidosis, a beta amyloidosis, but they have practically no neurodegeneration. And that becomes very important when we later discuss about the therapeutic approaches. So always be aware that if there's only the, 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 the 
amyloid related mutations uh, in the transgenic animals that you have in principle animals which have a lot of amyloid and extensive amyloid and a beta deposition but the, the neurodegeneration is sparse or completely absent <laughs> and the, uh, at the tau pathology and then you have the tau mutants which have relatively uh, which accumulate phosphorylated tau, but they do it relatively slowly. But when you then combine them and make double transgenic, what you can actually <coughs> then see is that the tau pat uh, pathology in the, uh, in the tau transgenic is massively accelerated when there is additional amyloid. Uh, uh, so in principle, these two are interconnected, but uh, you can show them in principle in the mouse model, but um, overall, in the normal, normally used mouse models, this is uh, actually only, uh, this is not really the case. Okay, we have all these actual, uh, all, all these, all these, these deposits of, of useful products. And the question is, what can we do again? And so many strategies for I think nearly 20 years or so was in the direction of blocking the formation of EBITDA or trying to dissolve it, well, dissolve the, 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 the these EBITDA deposits, etc. And that all actually didn't really lead to anything which, which made it into the clinic because it just didn't work in the clinic. But then there was a, a, a really interesting thing. Uh, this was uh, again in the 1980s, the first studies which actually showed that in uh, Alzheimer's disease there is not only neuronal and uh, a bit of the chief pathology, but there is also a profound reaction of the endogenous immune system with means of the microglia system. And so what uh, they found in principle that there is a profound microglia activation, there is deposition of acute phase proteins in, the, in this amyloid deposition, complement components, uh, and so on. So there are many different uh, changes related to some immune uh, problem uh, as a reaction to the deposition. You see that here very nicely, you can uh, see in principle uh, very nicely here that in these plaques which you see here, you have uh, always this massive activation and, and accumulation of microglia cells here. They are massively activated there and try somehow to handle this. this now, how is that with the microglia activation? And there is a very interesting uh, point in relation to neurodegeneration is that you have in principle two uh, three different types of microglia. So the first is the resting or homeostatic microglia in the normal brain, where in principle nearly all uh, functions of a macrophage have been shut off. So this is a very quiescent cell. Uh, the only thing what it has in high density is ATP receptors on the surface. And so they are extremely sensitive sensors for uh, neuronal membrane damage. Uh, and whenever this is the case, and ATP is released from the neurons, the microglia get really crazy and go there. But that's, that's the normal function. And with that, they are involved in more or less neuronal surveillance, but also in synaptic function and synaptic remodeling and so on. So they are very important cells for that. Now then, you have, when you have really neurodegeneration, then the cells actually get activated, alerted and activated. But interestingly, <coughs> in this situation, these the cells are quite good because they are activated into a so-called M2-like protective regeneration promoting phenotype. So what they produce is they produce anti-inflammatory cytokines and they, in addition, produce uh, then trophic factors like, for instance, including nerve growth factor, many other uh, growth factors which actually are important for nerve function and regeneration. So that is the early stage. And whenever you have, for instance, now a problem with these uh, uh, misfolded proteins, etc., Alzheimer's disease, prion disease, and others, first stage is that your microglia gets activated and tries somehow to uh, protect the tissue. 
And then when you need, uh, you need an additional uh, stimulus, uh, which would be an uh, endogenous ligand going through TLR, total like receptor activation, or an exogenous li uh, ligand, for instance, peripheral cytokine or even cytokine induction, you get an additional switch to microglia where this pre-activated microglia switches then into a cytotoxic um, macrophage-like uh, cell producing pro-inflammatory cytokines, <coughs> reactive oxygen species, etc. And so that uh, has been very nicely shown in a model of a prion disease, where actually uh, this, uh, this group has uh, very nicely shown that when you have uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, just the, 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 the prion uh, misfolded proteins in the early stages, you get actually a set of microglia which they call primed or comes up is that really the case also in humans and uh, that's a study was done in, in Great Britain where they systematically looked at Alzheimer's disease patients and looked at their time well, how, how, how rapid their, their dementia actually develops in a time frame of a year and then they selected patients who had practically no or no no, none, no reported infectious disease at all. And they then uh, made another group of patients who had actually relatively severe infections like gastrointestinal infections, pneumonia and things like that. And so what they found again that these uh, uh, patients which had the peripheral infections had a, a much more rapid development of cognitive decline in comparison to those in a, uh, a non-infectious environment. So that's certainly nice because that uh, shows you you can do something to slow down your Alzheimer's disease development by just preventing infection or treating them very early. So then, obviously, uh, people were thinking about uh, when that's the case, is uh, the case then one should block the microglia activation, block, for instance, oxidative injury, whatever, and you have then also H-dependent iron accumulation. And that has all been uh, discussed very much uh, as a general common uh, pathway of inducing neurodegeneration, which is not only now the case in Alzheimer's disease, but it's also the case in multiple sclerosis, in stroke, in other neurodegenerative diseases, that you start the disease and when the microglia is getting activated through these processes, it actually induces this cascade of mitochondrial injury oxygen damage and so on. And on that basis, obviously, the same therapies which uh, we have, I've shown you already in the MS story, are now also apparently applicable for Alzheimer's disease. However, one has to say that some of these therapies, uh, although those which are also not very effective in MS patients, have been tested to survive Alzheimer's disease patients, and they have actually not really made a so that's also somewhere in the beginning. But then there came another very interesting development, 
and that was in principle that uh, it was shown uh, experimentally when you immunize uh, mice who have actually uh, developed Alzheimer, also a, a bitter uh, type of Alzheimer's disease, if when you immunize them with a bitter peripheral, <coughs> that you can actually clear, stop the development of, of, of amyloid deposition in the brain, and you can even clear the amyloid, which is already present in the brain, from the brain through this immunization process. So that means that your immune system, when it's specifically reacting against the pathological misfolded protein, is able to actually eliminate the brain. So that was actually a bomb in the whole field, and the entire pharmaceutical industry was actually jumping on that. And this is the original uh, paper on that, very nice paper which showed actually an Alzheimer model which after a certain time develops this profound uh, epithelial deposits, particularly the hippocampus. And then uh, they used, they, they uh, 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 compared that, so these are transgenic animals have a lot of, 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 uh, of this amyloid and they have also a lot of clinical problems here, we're making a lot of errors in their uh, behavioral tests. Non-transgenic have does not. But then they took the transgenics and immunized them with A-beta, and the outcome was that the brain actually looked like a completely normal brain, and also the behavior was practically normal. So that means a really dramatic effect by just immunizing mice with the A-beta project. So how that, does that work? Uh, that has then uh, been shown by Basri that these anti-A-beta cells or other things to do for that, it's the antibodies. <coughs> and uh, it, it, uh, when you have the antibodies, then an intrafecal application, so when you directly inject them into the brain, um, cerebral spinal fluid is more effective than when they, when they are in this peripheral circulation, which is pretty trivial. Uh, and the antibody properties also have been quite clear. They have to bind uh, the uh, epita molecules in, in in vitro experiments, so they have to really bind onto these molecules. They have to bind to the end uh, terminal <coughs> part of the epita molecules, and uh, they have to be antibodies which can uh, have FC receptors bind. <laughs> On the one hand, that uh, these antibodies get into the brain, they bind to the FC receptors, and they uh, then uh, help the microbiome to bind to, 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 to phagocytosis material and to digest it. Uh, they can also block, in print, bind to soluble amyloid, which is actually toxic, and, uh, uh, and, and prevent the Then they can also prevent the aggregation of the And even, and this is the most surprising thing, they even when they are just in the periphery, <coughs> they can remove amyloid from the blood vessels and out in part by a lymphatic system along the blood vessels. And when you systematically remove the amyloid from the periphery, you get a better drainage. So that's very interesting and that's what really fascinating and everybody was absolutely convinced now we have solved the problem of Alzheimer's disease. Now then they made a clinical trial. And uh, so that is actually the situation. Uh, fortunately, most of the patients actually uh, agreed at the beginning of the trial that when they die, that their brain will be donated for investigation. And so uh, the, uh, these brains have, have been investigated from them. And you see on the left upper corner here, you see the uh, brain of, uh, of an unimmunized uh, patient uh, from the same clinic. And then you see the Alzheimer cases which were immunized, and you see a very variable amount of amyloid in there. So for instance, this case four has in principle the same uh, amyloid deposition as the, as the controls. 
but then you see others uh, where practically the entire amyloid has, has been removed from the brain. And this is really amazing that in these patients, apparently the therapy worked. So the question, did the therapy really work? And this was actually then correlated <coughs> with the antibody uh, titus of these patients against the internal portion of the epita. And there was a practically linear correlation with the more internal antibodies they had, the more efficient was the clearing in the central nervous system. <coughs> So that was certainly something which is very interesting. But then the big disappointment. And this is the, the clinical course of dementia development in the immunized versus the non-immunized patients. And what you see here that these cur curves are identical. So that means you can remove the entire amyloid load from the patient from the brain of an Alzheimer patient without having any effect on the clinical development of the dementia. So that was certainly you know, a big flaw. <coughs> and one of the possibilities is when you look at the time course of uh, amyloid deposition versus dementia development, what you see uh, in principle is that this is the, 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 the time point where you have the onset of the first clinical signs of Alzheimer's disease, where you have already a very profound a bitter deposition and also already quite a lot of, of uh, tau deposition. Now the treatment by the, in these patients were actually done at this stage. They had all mild to moderate dementia. And in that case, the brain is already overloaded with amyloid and also with tau tangles. Now, this amyloid therapy, the amyloid therapy, had no effect on the presence of tau, on, on, on tau tangles. So when they were there, they, they, they were not influenced by that. So it may be not so terribly surprising <coughs> that the clinical effects were not really given. So the quiz, the big, and then if you then look at this time point here, the first, uh, first day, first. And this is 20 to 30 years earlier. So that means already at the age of about 45, 40 or so, you start with your amyloid accumulation in the brain, developing Alzheimer's disease 20, 25 years later. So what is the consequences to earlier trials? And that's in principle <coughs> done in currently. There are, this is just the pharmaceutical industry is still fully engaged in this process. And there are all different antibodies which have been developed against the epita from different companies. And there are all the trials in phase two, phase three trials. So what is the difference here in these trials? So first of all, uh, many of these trials now start treatment at a much earlier time point. And uh, in particular, there are now new trials also where they start to treat uh, familiar Alzheimer's disease patients where you can very nicely predict when they will start with the disease uh, at a time point which is about 10 percent, uh, 10, 10 years before their uh, predicted onset of the disease. So we will see what's coming out from that. Uh, most of these trials actually when they have been completed have been as negative as the other. There is uh, a recent trial from Biogen uh, with one of the antibodies early the early treatment which, which reports some effect uh, So we will see what's coming out. It's still the chance that when you start early enough that you get, in principle, uh, a, a, a possibility. So what can, what are the, the strategies? Otherwise, obviously, uh, the, uh, this, this means prophylactic uh, vaccination is currently running. But it has also been shown that you can use the same strategy also for removing the intercellular tau tangles. <coughs> and that's really a major surprise because uh, the question how actually extracellular antibodies can remove intercellular accumulated uh, bleeding depositing tau protein is still a big question, uh, possibly by the, 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 the uh, 
only explanation so far provided is that there is still a, 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 an equilibrium between extracellular and intracellular from creating tau. And when you remove completely the extracellular, you may shift into the other direction. It's quite interesting. And then the anti-inflammatory the therapies, uh, they have so far also been fairly negative in Alzheimer's disease, so that's uh, currently still open. But I really want, in the last few slides, uh, remind you that this is not only uh, uh, the beneficial this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, vaccination and antibody treatment schedules, but they have the also this. And the first is actually the uh, immunization trial. In that case, actually, this come, came out from the original trial, which was actually terminated prematurely because uh, two patients actually died after the treatment, and there were another uh, uh, about eight or nine patients who actually got a neurological disease unrelated from Alzheimer's disease due to this vaccination. And the question again came up, what is it? And uh, this was quite interesting because what it turned out from the pathology that they induced in principle an autoimmune encephalomyelitis by immunizing with the brain protein. Yeah, so they have, have uh, these T cells, the antibodies, and then uh, uh, and then uh, induce these antibodies. And so the antibodies are good here in the amyloid, but if you have the T cells and you have the wrong MHC combinations and so on, then these T cells actually can induce a brain inflammatory disease. Uh, and uh, that is in principle what uh, shown. You see these inflammatory reactions here. Yeah? And uh, that is, was predictable uh, that this may happen because we know already, and we knew already from our other neurological studies, that any brain specific protein, when you take it and you immunize persons who are animals with the right MHC that, that you can really present this peptide to T cells and get a strong T cell response, will get encephalitis. That was already known before these studies were actually initiated. It were not known by the neurobiologists and the uh, pharmaceutical industry people who, who have done these studies. And why has this not been seen in the animal models? No wonder you use one mouse strain with a single MHC. If you have uh, a wrong peptide, it will never present it. they got classical EAU with the epitosensitive infection. So that's one thing. <coughs> can we overcome that? Yes. Uh, in principle, one can go uh, to that in a different way. In particular, this strategy, which actually has been developed in a company in Vienna, is extremely attractive. What they actually did was take the small epito, uh, N-terminal B-cell epitope and connect it with a very strong T cell epitope from a protein, a plant protein, which is certainly never expressed in any human tissue. So they get a very strong T cell response, a very good help for the antibody production, get high titers of antibodies, but the T cells are completely unpathogenic in humans because they cannot find the antigen. So that's a very, very elegant strategy. The other strategy, which is much more uh, favored by the pharmaceutical industry is uh, to develop human monoclonal antibodies because in this Im immunization strategy you just make a single shot and then the thing is gone whereas in the human antibody therapies you have to treat them every week certainly the business is completely different but this is not the only side effect the other side effect is uh, what is called ARIA <coughs> and ARIA is amyloid related imaging am abnormalities uh, associated with clinical problems and this is also occurring after the antibody therapy so these patients, at least a subset of them, develop headache, neuropsychiatric disturbances, cognitive problems and if you look at the MRI what you see is that they have the lunar microhemorrhages in the brain as microbleedings and hemorrhagic depositions and the mechanism for that is that when you liberate the amyloid from tissue, 
it gets into a soluble form and is then transported into the perivascular space. And what you get here, this is also in the normal Alzheimer's disease, you have no normally some sort of clearance and diffusion along the periarteriolar sheets of the, uh, of the amyloid protein into the, uh, out, of the, out of the brain compartment. And when you have Alzheimer's disease, what you get in principle that this A beta may actually accumulate here. And you get what is called A beta uh, or uh, Alzheimer's disease, A beta amyloidosis of, uh, of the vessels. Now, when you then very rapidly uh, dissolve uh, the protein, in the epithelial uh, protein in the parenchyme, you increase these peri perivascular amyloid deficits. And you get, at least during the, the time of the therapy, you get increased uh, load of amyloid in the vessels and increased vascular damage. And that actually can give rise to these side effects. So in principle, this is all fine, but all these therapies have certainly their shortcomings. So having all said that, I explained you in two classical examples of brain diseases, which are very important, that the, the, the march in principle from the biological discovery, the tra experimental models and so on, then into the clinical side and then into an effective treatment, is actually a steep way and relatively slow. Uh, and it's also associated with lots of surprises, and many of the surprises are rather bad surprises. So that's all. Thank you.